On this segment of my IGN Unfiltered interview with Harmonix co-founder Alex Ragopoulos, Alex talks about the meteoric rise of Guitar Hero Rock Band and the music rhythm genre, and then its stunning fall. Uh, so that, now so I'm, gonna move, I'm gonna move the questioning into now the, the gaming section of, of your career. And that's, uh, so Karaoke Revolution, big hit for you guys. Was that sort of the, the first time where you, were, you really felt like you were on solid footing as a, as a company, or? Well, it's the, see, it's hard to say. So, um, you know, the first games that you mentioned that we made were Frequency and then it's sequel Amplitude that yeah. we made for, uh, for Sony. And those games, uh, you know, th that was pretty painful for us, those games, because we thought we had broke it, started to break through as a business. Right. We had to deal with Sony. They were a big, mighty publisher. Sure. There was television advertising and ma you know, mass market distribution of the games, and we thought, and those games were critical darlings. They got great reviews. The people who played them loved them. And we thought, oh, this is it. This is our, this is our moment. We're right. finally going to have an actual business, and the people, you know, people will finally play the games that we're making. And neither of them was commercially successful. I mean, they sold a little bit, but um, you know, not, they were not profitable businesses. And I think one of the hard lessons for us at that point was to realize that making a game that was fun to play once you tried it was actually not enough. That we really had to, because when we explained those games to people, no one understood them at all. They looked at a screenshot, <laughs> they looked at a description, and everyone just, they're just like eyes glazed over. And I think we realized that we had a we had to start thinking more deeply about the wrapper around the game. What is the fantasy, like who are you asking the player to be? What is the fantasy that they're stepping into? Or what is the mental model of the, you know, what is the wrapping paper that you're trying to lure them into the experience with, right? And so um, when Konami came to us and said, hey, would you guys like to make a, a karaoke game for us, which became Karaoke Revolution, for the first time we started thinking about how to package the, the game. And Karaoke Revolution was uh, moderately successful. I mean, we did, I think, five titles in that series for yeah. Konami, so it paid the bills for years, and you know they sold enough to keep making them, and that was great, but they weren't like big hits or anything like that. Um, and um, so to, back to your question, like, did we finally feel like we were you know, on solid footing as a business? Sort of, but we, you know, we, you know, we were living hand to mouth for that whole period, Frequency, Amplitude, and all the Karaoke Revolution titles, plus one non-music game that we did for Sony, the iToy anti-grav game oh, yeah. that we did, um, which, which is a, was a very emotionally complicated even decision to do that project. Um, you know, we were living hand to mouth, and we had, did not have a hit product, and in fact, um, you know, we did the iToy game for Sony anti-grav, and we had this mo moment of doubt in 2004 like, when that shipped. Like a crisis of conscience? Yeah, absolutely, thing. because that game, it was our, um, it was not a music game. It was our lowest reviewed game by far. Mm. Um, and it outsold everything else we had ever done oh. by far. <laughs> And uh, there was a moment in you know fall of 2004 after we had shipped that where we were like we were looking at that information and thinking to ourselves we're almost 10 years in at this point, not nine years in we're li still living hand to mouth we've never we've, we've had critical success but never commercial success, and then here we make this non music game that's like kind of mediocre and yet it blows away the sales of everything else we've done what the what the hell are we doing making music games like is this just a fool's errand this whole thing our whole reason for being. Um, and it was right at that moment we were, where we were having serious crisis of confidence about whether to continue that uh, a tiny little publisher called Red Octane called us and, and you know, they, at that point they made dance mats, like third party yeah. dance mats for Dance Dance Revolution and they wanted to become a publisher and they basically said to us, hey, um, if we make a guitar peripheral, will you make a guitar game? And, uh, and that became Guitar Hero. And then, of course, after we shipped Guitar Hero, that's at that point we finally felt like we had a business. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But I'm kind of curious. So, I mean, do you have do you have like are your is your family wondering what the hell you're doing with your life? Or are, are, are they is, are they super supportive? Or because you know you're, you're saying you're, you're talking about how almost ten years and it's you're just kind of you're getting by but not really succeeding. It, did you think about just? Shutting the whole thing down and and uh, trying to figure out something else to do with your life at any point, or not really. I mean, everyone everyone was so supportive. Family. I mean, our our investors, our angel investors, who had been supporting us through all those years, 
were amazing, meaning I think a lot, most investors would have written us off like long earlier, but we kept getting new rounds of investment and people willing to, to stay with us while we kind of slowly figured it all out. Um, and yeah, there was that moment around the release of Antigrav where we were like, God, is this what, what are we doing, you know? But even in that darkest moments, I think that we still felt the same passion about the mission that we felt at the very beginning of the whole thing. That's great. Um, so, um, you know, we're just fortunate that in the end it all, you know, worked out okay. Did uh, you realize that the irony of, of what you, or how I just heard your, that whole story, it's exactly like you were actually living out a band fantasy. <laughs> you, were, you were the cool indie band who, every, who a bunch of people loved but never broke through with success, and then you're like one pop song <laughs> broke through and had success, and you questioned your entire sort of musical integrity. It's like there was the, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but it, that seems fitting that, that it's, yeah, it's no, just exactly that same arc. Very much that model, yeah. <laughs> um, so had you guys seen, or were, were you aware of Guitar Freaks out of Japan before going into Guitar Hero? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was, and I think, um, you know, Red Octane, when they approached us and said, hey, would you guys make a guitar game? I, that was very much, you know, everyone was uh, was aware of that. And yeah. I think the assessment was, okay, well, that's a great source of inspiration, but there are so many aspects of that product that make it not suitable for a Western market in terms of the music that's in sure. it, the visual aesthetics, the, you know, and um, some game design choices, et cetera. So uh, on the one hand, we were aware of it and thought it was really cool, actually, and it was a great sort of point of inspiration. On the other hand, you know, we kind of wanted to throw away everything, you know, it's everything and start from a blank, uh, yeah. do, blank slate. Do you go find it and play it, or do you just want to not even, like, you, you want to sort of, of stay away from it and just have your own sort of idea of what how you wanted to tackle a guitar game. Yeah, well, I mean, we had all played Guitar Freaks in the arcades in Tokyo, so we yeah. knew the game, but when we were working on Guitar Hero, we weren't actually actively playing it because I think we, to a large degree, we didn't want choices that they had made to, you know, complicate or pollute yeah. our thinking about it. Yeah, it makes sense. So in the beginning of Guitar Hero, you guys could pretty much only get cover songs. Um, was it was that sort of a financial thing, like just because the the masters would have cost more, or was it just because nobody knew who you were really, and and the the, the labels De weren't going to hand over Definitely the, the real both. stuff? Definitely both. I mean, it's at least twice as expensive to get the uh, the the original masters. So there's the financial factor. I mean, and this was a tiny indie project. I mean, yeah. we didn't have the budget to go after the original masters, and even if we did, frankly, like no one had heard of us and. Recording artists and the labels, you know, understandably are protective of original masters. They don't want to just license it to anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's kind of brand asso association and attachments that go along with that. So, um, really, no one would give us the time of day at that point. Um, it's funny, you know, with frequency and amplitude, uh, we actually had original masters in those games because the Sony was our publisher and Sony can Could get things happen, done. Yeah. Yes, and Sony was great at that. Um, but when it was a tiny indie project, it was just not feasible. You guys found some, like the, the, the covers that are in the original game, and, and Guitar Hero 2 a bit as well, they're pretty good. Like yeah. how, how uh, are there any, do you have any sort of interesting stories from either uh, finding those, those musicians to do that stuff or? Well, it was all in one studio on the West Coast, this great group called Wave Group that we found. I forgot how we found them, maybe through Sony, I can't remember, but, uh, but a fantastic group of musicians who just really threw themselves into that with whole heart and did uh, fantastic covers for us, yeah. Who, do you remember who, uh, who was sort of the, the first major artist that you remember really getting on board with, with Guitar Hero saying, you know, I believe in it, like, take, my ma take the master, I totally believe in what you're doing. Or maybe, I don't know if that didn't come till Rock Band. I mean, you had some originals, but do you remember that first artist of really I don't really remember you. the first artist because I think a lot of them kind of came together at the same moment. But it was when you know after uh, uh, after Guitar Hero One happened and we were working on Guitar Hero Two during that year. You know, Red Octane got acquired by Activision and we yeah. got acquired by Viacom by MTV Networks. And so when we started working on Rock Band and putting some stakes in the ground about the aspect the aspects of Rock Band that. We, we thought we're going to be critical and, and move the genre forward. One of them was 
getting original masters. And, um, and so at that point, we had MTV Networks helping us go out to get that music, <laughs> and it's a little easy. I mean, between the commercial success of the earlier titer, titles and the buzz around that, and then having more budgets, you know, it was a lot easier to go get, get the material at that point. So. so Guitar Hero exploded, of course. Was there, uh, was there a moment in your life where you realized, like, oh, this is huge and like, we did it? There was. There was a very specific moment. Um, it wasn't huge yet, but it was winter. I think it was like February-ish of 2006. So at that point, it was um, a few months after uh, Guitar Hero 1 had been released. And, and Guitar Hero 1 was not like a big hit out of the gate, right? Like our tiny publisher, Red Octane, yeah. Red Octane, like they didn't have budgets for marketing. They didn't have budgets to manufacture tons of inventory. So it was... It was not selling big yet, but there was a moment that winter, uh, a few months after it shipped, where you know YouTube was kind of a new thing at that point, ish, newish, and uh, and I just typed Guitar Hero into YouTube, and what I saw was literally hundreds of videos that people had made of themselves playing the game and, po cool. and, and posted, <laughs> and I had like a kind of goosebumps moment, you know, where I realized something cultural was happening with the game. Was there? Uh... When, when the whole thing, I mean, then the rock band comes out, and did you feel like when rock band hits, is that the, is that sort of, was that the, the end point for the studio? Like, was that sort of, did rock band achieve everything the, the studio sort of was about and stood for? Well, let's see. So, gosh, big question. In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Um, the ways in which I would say yes it did is that this vision for a kind of uh, big budget, multiplayer, music performance simulation with multiple instruments and original masters and it's being marketed by MTV and we're a major distribution and it's, you know, it's like, it, had, it, it was like a fully realized version of a vision that had existed for more than a decade right. in some form, you know, being brought to market with trumpets and it was, so it definitely felt like a, a kind of pinnacle in that regard of something we had been striving for for a very long time. However, it didn't feel that way. It didn't, it huh. really didn't, we didn't, it, it didn't feel like a victory. It actually in some ways felt like the game was beginning. And there was a lot of tension at that point for a couple of reasons. Um, First of all, it was not proven yet that people would spend like two hundred dollars for a video game. Right. You know that we were like, full God, kit, full yeah. band kit. We were like, what the hell are we thinking, right? Like, people are, are people really going to spend this much money? We for had a to, game? And you had to convince retailers too to take a that giant, stock. A giant box. <laughs> um, so there was that, and furthermore. Um, uh, you know, Guitar Hero is now owned by Activision. Activision is very good at what they do. Uh, Guitar Hero by Guitar Hero 3, which launched right around the same time yep. as Rock Band 1, it was a huge franchise at that point. Absolutely gargantuan with like Activision fully behind it at retail and in paid media. And it was like, that's where all of the heat was. You know, the, the kind of market heat was around Guitar Hero 3. And all of a sudden, you know, Rock Band, which was this big thing for us, right? It was kind of like the indie You're entry. Still the indie, yeah. We're still the underdog, <laughs> like coming in to fight against Activision. Geez, you know, and we didn't, you know, we really didn't know how that was going to play out. You know, so there was a lot of anxiety and stress. We were also learning how to do hardware for the first time. We had never done that before in our lives. Meanwhile, it's like okay, in a year we have to go from knowing nothing about making hardware to like shipping like millions and millions of units into, yeah. into retail. So mostly we just like lost a lot of sleep that year. So it wasn't really a moment of celebration so much as a moment of anxiety because we were entering a competition against a total juggernaut. Right. Did, did I mean, be honest, did it, did it piss you off that Guitar Hero 3 was built on the back of what you'd made, was the one that took off and you, know, you, you guys had made this thing and now it was just sold and, and t sort of the, the momentum that you'd, <laughs> that you'd started was, wasn't, you weren't sort of reaping the, the benefits of that? Well, um, so, uh, I wouldn't say we were angry about it. It was emotionally complicated um, because we were um, emo we were attached to the Guitar Hero brand. Like we we had poured our hearts and souls yeah. into crafting that brand identity, and we loved it. And so then seeing it, uh, and then so for it to become 
our, you know, our arch nemesis in the marketplace with, you know, versus our new brand was just tough for us because on the one hand, you know, rock band, it's our thing now. Like we want to be victorious with sure. our new brand, right? But the flip side is like we didn't exactly want to beat Guitar Hero. We love Guitar Hero, <laughs> right? And so to some degree, uh, you know, we were happy to see both of them thriving and evolving in their own different directions and whatnot. Um, you know, but like business is business and competition is hard, and so you know we that, we had. But to deal like, with that. Do you, so th GH three and Rock Band had had some crossover on songs. Mm -hmm. Do you is there like a, a creative and professional pride where you compare your note charts and you're like ours is better? Yep. <laughs> Because yes, I would do is. that. Yes, there is. We took. We, there is definitely <laughs> professional pride in in the in the note charting in one domain. Yeah, for sure. Because that to me that was always the big difference between. I mean, with all due respect to the developers that worked on uh, the games after you left. Like again, what I said at the top of the interview, you guys are musicians who happen to make video games. Whereas I think when it when it wasn't you guys making Guitar Hero anymore, it was it was video game developers making. A, a game about music, and yep. I, I think to the player there was a almost an, a, a difficult thing to pin, pin down there. But when you played it, you could tell. Yeah, you could tell the difference. No, and it was it's it's one of the things that has been a super high priority for us in in making music games is making sure that those aspects, the musical aspects of gameplay choices, are you know thoughtfully attended to. And our audio department, they're all like Berklee College of Music grads and uh, you know or other you know serious hardcore like professional musicians who yeah. really take this stuff seriously and do great work. Would you uh, from time to time would you guys throw out like entire note charts and just start over on a song? Because I remember uh, this is too inside baseball, but I remember there was a, a version of, um, oh boy, I think it was, might have been The Seeker. It was a Who song oh, yeah. that was, we had, we had uh, the debug kits at our office and you, know, you guys would put upload stuff to there because it was a developer network. Yep. And then, but then when the song finally to came out later, it was a totally different note chart. Yeah, so yeah. Was, were there times where you guys just, like, you just felt like you'd review something and felt like, oh, this isn't quite working? And, and yeah. Just redo your approach to how to do a song. Well, we iterate on that stuff, and so maybe there'll be a first pass on gameplay authoring, on note charting, and then it'll go into our audio QA group, Aqua, we call them, and um, and who are also musicians and also you know have like they play the game very well, yeah. and as you can imagine, <laughs> and also have very strong opinions about you know charting approach and charting quality, and there will can be some back and forth if like the first pass is kind of missing something. So uh, the the. The meteoric rise and fall of the guitar, you know, rock band type, uh, the guitar game genres is, is well chronicled. Do you do you blame Activision for it? Do you blame yourselves? Do you think that was, is it really nobody's fault? Was it just sort of it was what it was? How do you sort of look back on that two to three year window where it just went was huge and then it seemed like it was pretty much over? Yeah, well, so complicated subject, of course, but I mean, I think there's a lot of like uh, armchair analysis about it where people just be like, yeah, Activision oversaturated the market and that's why it, you know, collapsed. And, you know, there's probably some truth to that. They, they were releasing an insane number of titles and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So that's maybe an ingredient, but I think the reality is way more complicated than that. Um, for example, um, well, one factor is, you know, we, uh, we were selling the most expensive video games in the market on top of a severe financial recession, right? It's you know it was as hard as it might have been to buy a you know an ex, a two hundred dollar video game in holiday of two thousand seven. Imagine that in two thousand eight or two thousand nine, yeah. when all of a sudden incomes are contracting and yeah. people are you know very financially anxious. So that was a factor. Um, I also think um, uh, that the games did not evolve to provide either sufficient innovation or the right kind of innovation to keep people's interest. I think both Activision and we had a misplaced confidence that just by refreshing the music in the game, there would be enough novelty to sustain everyone's interest in yeah. the gameplay. And actually, that has been true for some people. I mean, we still have this dedicated core of players who are like showing up every week to play the game and buying the new songs and god I love those people right you know because they have they've s sustained the franchise Absolutely. for you know 10 years now but in terms of that that heyday of you know whatever we had like you know 1. tens of millions of people playing the game they had that experience and loved that experience in that window 
but then they had had it, and just giving them more music to have an identical experience, I think, was not going to be enough to uh, to sustain their interest. There were, frankly, a lot of casual gamers who showed up in kind of peak Wii. You know, there was yeah. that period where like a lot of non-gamers were suddenly playing console games because of the Wii brought sure. in this new audience, and a lot of those people have moved on from consoles, and they're now playing like tablet and phone games, right? And uh, you know, I don't think we're going to get those people back on the consoles. So in hindsight, it. What would you what would you have done differently, if anything? Um, well, I probably would have accelerated the innovation uh, along some axes that actually we're now very actively engaged in. Um, but you know, I would if I could rewind the clock ten years, I probably would have tried to make progress on some of those axes. You know, several years earlier, actually. Uh, you've now no doubt met a whole lot of famous rock musicians face to face mm -hmm. uh, in your life. Do you have any are, do you have any good stories from from meeting anybody? Anything anything crazy? Even like maybe convincing them to be to be in the game or or something yeah, like that. Yeah, so the most interesting of course was the Beatles. Uh, yeah, I was going to get to that but go right ahead. Well, so this was a pro that was a very long courtship. Uh, it actually started with uh, George Harrison's son, da Danny Harrison, mm -hmm. wonderful chap, a musician. He was also a Guitar Hero fan, and you know we were introduced to him through uh, through uh, the MTV uh, music president, this guy named Van Toffler, also a wonderful guy, and he immediately saw the you know the potential of doing a you know a a Beatles rock band game and be, you know be, so we began meeting all of the constituents which involved like the, the label side multiple labels the publishing all of the you know surviving the, sur yeah, yeah I mean, Yoko the, and Danny Harrison yeah and that you know the, the Apple Apple core and uh, so it was a long courtship process as it should be because that's uh, you know that's material that you want to take very seriously yeah. if you're gonna give it a video game treatment and so there was a moment where we uh, you know, we had our first meeting with Paul McCartney and in, in London, and uh, we wanted to show him the gameplay, the Rock Band gameplay, but not just with anything. We wanted to show it to him with Beatles music. Sure. So we mo mocked up. It, this wasn't Beatles Rock Band at this point. It was just Rock Band, but yeah. with some Beatles music that we had kind of hacked into it to, um, so that I could show him the game with his own music. So we were over there doing a demo. And, what um, song did you pick? Um, Taxman, I think, was the one I was playing in that demo. And... Um, Were you on drums? Because I know you like you. You tend to play in in public demonstrations of rock band. You often tend. to I do often the play the drums. Yeah, that's that's kind of you know that's my default go to. But in this case, I was playing the bass because it was is his bass part, right? <laughs> and the funny thing is, so I don't. I generally don't get nervous when like meeting celebrities or whatever. But this was a case where this guy like I've idolized this band since I was like seven years old. So I was nervous. And in fact, when I was playing the part for him, I was. Uh, uh, flubbing it a bit, you know, which is not something I normally do, but I'm like, really? This is when I'm gonna like, you know, not be nailing the part? And he sort of joked, um, he said, actually, I really needed to understand what happens when you don't play all the notes correctly, so that's, you know, informative. And then he also, afterwards, he did something that was just incredibly warm and generous, which is, he said, um, uh, look, obviously you're nervous. Uh, he, he says, when I'm nervous, and then he pulls out this, this um, this kind of bunch of lavender, this fresh cut lavender, and he like pulled out a few sprigs and he said, here, I cut this from my garden this morning. I, um, I keep this with me when I travel through the city so that I don't get stressed out in traffic wow. or other things. You should have some, you just smell it, you know, and it just helps you relax. And that, I just what was a, kind of, What a wonderful human it, being. It was, it was like, like an incredibly like warm gesture and it actually kind of set the tone for the collaboration over the subsequent year or, or so, where actually every, you know, all of the members involved, I mean, they were holding us to a very high standard, as they should have, yeah. but they were very, they were, you know, with us on that journey trying to make it great. Is, is that, uh, is, where, did, or where does Beatles Rock Band rank on your list of career accomplishments? Well, I mean, it was, uh, if not the high point, certainly on the short list of, of uh, high points for me personally. I mean that, you know, there's exactly one moment in uh, in all of the games we've released where I actually like broke down crying while playing our own game, and that was actually in the final cinematic of the you know uh, in the song the end. Yeah. You know, playing uh, the Beatles, where I was like, wow, I I feel really proud of what we've done here. What was 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 the could you feel any different energy at the company during the development of that game because of 
I'm yourself, and I'm sure a lot of other people were even probably more invested in in making sure that that the Beatles rock band was as good as it could be. Well, it was. I mean, everyone was excited because Jesus, we're making a Beatles game, right? Like, and that so that was exciting. But it's also the stakes were high, right? You know, for example, there was uh, there was this one day where Yoko came to the studio, and we were showing her the our first cut at making John oh. singing and animated in the game. And when we were showing her, you could just see it in her face. She was not happy. It oh. wasn't, it just wasn't good enough. And she, you know, she let us know in no uncertain terms that it was not good enough. And she was very clear about the ways in which it wasn't. And that was pretty stressful for people. Like we hadn't really ever as video game makers kind of had a client to please in exactly the same way as we did uh, with the, uh, uh, on that project, but the result of us, ha of, you know, having our feet held to the fire in that way was we ended up making a much better game, I think, than we would have so otherwise. So all your animators are just sweating bullets <laughs> yeah. in the back of the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, there, our cre our creative lead on that project is this fellow named uh, Josh Randall, wonderful guy, really talented guy, and I don't know how he survived it, honestly, having to keep that group of people happy all at the same time. Uh, so then, so after that, then in 2010. You and, and other Harmonic shareholders, uh, of which I assume you are one of the significant mm -hmm. shareholders as a co-founder, uh, you ended up suing Viacom uh, from what I believe, if I read the whole thing correctly, over bonus payments. Um, and you ended up being awarded $300 million. You won. Was, what was, what's, what's that day like when you have to sort of fight for your live, your, you know, what you've, what you've earned as a company and then you actually win? Well, uh, God, huge complicated subject. So first of all, to be clear, um, you know, the way that all worked is that there were, uh, when we sold the company to Viacom, um, you know, at that point we had been funded by angels for years and yeah. years. So we were, you know, the large majority of the company was actually owned by our investors at that point. And it was a you know an earnout deal, meaning that there were contingent payments based upon the you know financial performance of the business sure. over the subsequent years. So it was actually that lawsuit was not by you know the employees, uh, you know the studio. It was by essentially the head of the investor group. Right, okay. who, um, and so that was you know who was responsible for for leading that dispute. Although it was a you know legitimate dispute over you know the terms of the merger that they had acquired us, and so it was. It was pretty anxiety producing for, for us for years to have that kind of hanging over our heads. You know, we felt like we had done a deal in good conscience and we had like worked our hardest to like make the business successful over the subsequent years. And so to have that, you know, conflict arise after that was like certainly not pleasant. Um, but, you know, obviously we were happy at the end of the process. Yeah, because I had uh, Richard Garriott in here too, and he ended up uh, having to sue NCSoft and he ended up winning. And, and yeah, he, he said, and it's, it's just like, it's it's just like the worst. You don't wish a loss like having to endure a lawsuit on anybody. It sounds like it's just one of the most stressful things you can possibly have in your life. It is incredibly stressful and unpleasant. And I mean, part of it just comes from the fact that um, in lawsuits, lawyers uh, will it seems will say anything uh, completely unanchored to the truth in any way. You'll see. I mean, like anyone who's been through a lawsuit, you know has seen this, right? But you'll just see opposing counsel say things. <laughs> and, you know, and everyone's jaws will hit the floor that these things are being said. They're so detached from reality, you know? So that's, you know, that's, uh, and I'm not just, I'm not talking about Viacom in this case. You know, we've been through other lawsuits and whatnot, um, you know, which happens to, really to any business. But after a while, you realize that that's kind of just what the game is about, you know? That their lawyers like saying anything to, you know, make their clients, to get a good result for their clients, and that's just. Richard Garriott said the exact same thing to me, that it was just telling me about utter fabrications that would happen and how, and how just, as, a, as someone who's not, a, you, you know, you're not used to being in a court, it's just completely shocking. It is. Oh, man. Uh, so after, the, after that lawsuit's over, was, did you ever have any thought to just walking away and saying, you know what, I, <laughs> we won, I'm, I'm doing okay, Let's, I, I should just walk away and retire and not do this anymore? Not really, um, in large part because, I mean, look, the, the fact that we were commercially successful and there are financial rewards that come from that, uh, you know, that's great, of sure. course. Um, but um, we, 
what's driving us every day isn't really the hope of financial rewards. Like that's that's kind of icing on the cake. Yeah. Like it's uh, like the most emotional moments for us are always when we ship a game that we're proud of and then watching the world react to that is like, that's the real compensation in a lot of ways. Like seeing people uh, going crazy about a game that we've made oh, is I mean, like, that is the best food. You know? I've, I've told you this before, but I mean, I, to me, Rock Band is, it's definitely a top five game of all time for me because I've never before and never since had a, a multiplayer experience like that where there is, you get four people in a room playing that game, yeah. there is an energy there in is, that room yeah. That's that's that a you know a Halo or a Call of Duty or a you know a StarCraft that just these other great multiplayer games. It's just a different, it's just a different thing. When did you know? Actually, I'll just back up real quick for a second. When did you know that you had some that sort of secret sauce with with Rock Band? When did you know it just there, worked? Pretty early on, and and actually with our. I would say that generally with our best games, you know pretty early in development. Uh, you know, for example, with Guitar Hero 1, when the first prototype was up, it was ugly, it was all programmer art, just like black and white yeah. scratches on a screen, low quality audio, and yet, it was already super fun. You just wanted to play again immediately, you know, when, it, when, when the song ended. And I would say I felt something pretty similar in the early prototypes of Rock Band. It was like, super hacked in a bunch of ways, but just the fact that you were doing this thing, you were playing this music game, and you were playing it with this group of other people, and your, your collective survival depended upon everyone to kind of doing their part, and it all meshed together into this kind of unified experience. It just clearly, you know, there was something special there. Yeah, so, I, I remember in, uh, er, before Rock Band 1 came out, there was a video that either leaked or got onto YouTube it was of uh, four people from Harmonix playing Welcome to the Jungle. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. And it just it looked like the most fun thing I'd ever seen, and then it certainly turned out that way. Uh, yeah. For much more on Alex Rogopoulos' fascinating career at Harmonix, be sure to check back every week for new segments from this interview, and check back every month for brand new episodes of IGN Unfiltered.